For me, making visual music involves both a foray into advanced digital technology and a test of my skills as a clarinetist. In this video, I'm aiming to explain my approach to an art form that can enhance the emotional impact of music. And in the process, I think you'll see that there's much more to visual music than first meets the eye or engages the ear. I'll explain what I mean with reference to three visual music pieces that I've produced and performed over the last few years. Ragatai, A Beam Day's Wasser, and Paseggiata. I'll start in the city of Fatipa Sikri in North India. It's a ghost town now, but for a brief period in the 16th century, it was the city where Emperor Akbar, Akbar the Great, gathered together musicians from every corner of North India to give regular performances of Hindustani classical music at his court. And so as to better understand the complexities of Indian raga, he underwent some training as a vocalist himself, enough to develop an in-depth appreciation of the skills of the 30 or so classical musicians he retained. Soon after Akbar's move to the new city of Fatipa Sikri, in 1570, he was joined there by Mian Tansen, who quickly became the emperor's favourite musician, even though, at 57, he was well beyond normal retiring age. And one anecdote in particular illustrates the central role of music at Fatipa Sikri. Akbar asked Tansen to sing Raga Deepak, the Raga of Light, with the result that all the lamps in the palace courtyard lit up spontaneously and Tansen's body became dangerously hot. But as Tansen had known in advance what would happen, he'd taken the precaution of teaching his daughter to play one of his own compositions, Raga Mian Maha, which, by repute, caused rain to pour down. And when she played, the heavens opened and Tansen was saved. We shouldn't take such a story literally, because as Ravi Shankar explains, ragas induce enhanced state in the minds of listeners, rather than changes in the physical environment that surrounds them. Raga is a prime example of art in mind. The unbroken tradition of Hindustani classical music stretches back 2,000 years or more, to when ragas were an integral part of Vedic ceremonies in Hindu temples. Then, as now, the universal, deeper meaning of raga performance was conveyed by the Sanskrit saying, Ranjayati iti raga, which means that which colours the mind is a raga. And to an extent, I followed Akbar's example by immersing myself in Ranjayati iti raga, so as to gain some understanding of the art of raga performance which differs radically from what we're used to as performers in the West. The result raga time is both an oral and visual interpretation of Beliscani Todi, a raga reputedly performed by Tansen's son, Beliscani, at his father's funeral to evoke a mood of delightful admiration. It follows the oldest of the Hindustani classical genre known as a drupad, a genre that Tansen developed at Fatipa Sikri. It starts with an alap, which is a deep and meditative musical investigation into the rising and falling seven-note octave which characterizes Beliscani Todi. And when performed, the alap presents a powerful force of emotions such as sadness, yearning, and submission to a heightened state of awareness where, as tradition dictates, the singer or instrumentalist sets the rasa, that is the emotion or sentiment of the piece. In Raga time, I supplement this oral mode of expression with a visual mode, which reveals momentous events taking place in Akbar's court. I haven't needed to imagine these scenes in my mind's eye, because Akbar kept an atelier of artists at Fatipa Sikri, who recorded every moment of court life in a series of Indian miniatures 
that are now distributed in galleries throughout the world. And from this immense store or memory bank of information, I've chosen just a few images that to my mind reflect the music and story of Biliskani Todi. I'll now perform the first part of Raga time. <laughs> images in Raga time served only to provide a cultural prompt in guiding your responses to Biliskani Todi. They didn't add significantly to the emotional impact of the music. But now I'll move on to my second example of visual music where I've set my sights higher by making a determined effort to penetrate the mind of a composer so as to uncover the hidden imagery that lay behind his notation. The piece is called a beam des oiseaux, abyss of the birds. It throws some new light on the synesthetic world of Olivier Messiaen, a composer who during his lifetime revealed much about his sound world, but remained comparatively reticent about his world of colour. It was during a conversation with Claude Samuel in 1986 that Messiaen gave some first insight into the colours that moved with his music when he explained how the shimmering stained glass of Chartres Cathedral had provided throughout his life a joyful experience, a place where he could fully indulge the sensory impact of his synesthetic world. For me, this was the key that enabled me to locate the imagery that lay behind the composer's notation, a piece for solo clarinet that became eventually a central movement within Messiaen's quartet for the end of time. All of my imagery for a beam day's oiseau was based on a single rose window at Chartres Cathedral. By incorporating, in my interpretation, celestial colours, abstract shapes and religious references, all gleaned from my rose window source, I was aiming to second guess the visual mental images that could have occupied Messiaen's own mind when composing the piece. I'll perform part of it now.
It was only after completing my visual interpretation that I came across Messiaen's preface to Color de la Cité Celeste, a piece written in 1964, over 20 years after the quartet for the end of time. At this later date, Messiaen overtly declared that its form was dependent on colour, like the rose window of a cathedral with its flamboyant and invisible colours. A description which, as it happened, aptly described my visual interpretation of a beam day's oiseau. This reference to the window's flamboyant colours appeared to endorse my own choice of imagery. But how had this happened? Why had I chosen just this one specific rose window as my source of visual inspiration when in fact I had any number of other sources to choose from? I can see now that it was Messiaen's synesthetic skills that made my choice inevitable. It was his ability to accurately transmute a wide range of celestial colours into audible sound combinations that enabled me to hear the colours that moved with his music, and thereby see what was in his mind's eye. Does this explanation sound too fanciful, I wonder? Not, I think, when we begin to uncover some of the mystery that surrounds the way our brains conjure up visual imagery as an endless source of fantasy. When we're listening to music, for instance, many of us allow our minds to wander as we experience visual imagery relating to past events or picture ourselves in the future. It can be argued that such experiences have some therapeutic value by making us feel either more energetic or possibly calmer. Stephen Coslin, in his book Ghosts in the Mind's Machine, describes mental images as private creations. Although mental imagery and perception that's what we see with our eyes, operate in similar ways, they're far from being identical. With mental imagery, we can think about and transform what our mind's eye has told us. This is the key feature of mental events, the ease by which they can create scenes that never really existed, or, as Coslin comments, transform the commonplace into the extraordinary. Another striking fact about mental images is that we don't have to have them all the time. We can get rid of them when we wish. It can be assumed then that images must be stored in our long-term memories in some way that allows us to call on them when we want them. In this regard, mental imagery is quite different from vision, which operates whenever our eyes are open and brings us a continuous stream of images whether or not we choose to concentrate on them. This voluntary quality of mental images and our capacity to get rid of them when we don't want to look at them explains those fleeting periods of mind wandering that most of us experience when we are at a concert. These can be described as unstable images formed in the mind's eye, literally art in mind, and can be described as quasi-pictorial ghosts they can't easily be compared to the form pictures take in the real world, like photographs, paintings or slides. There must be something more diffuse than paper, canvas or beams of light that make these visions become real. Coslin has put forward the idea of a visual buffer in the brain, which reveals at its centre an image that is fully resolved but with decreasing resolution towards the periphery. This means, for instance, that my pictorial representation of Akbar's court are far too evenly resolved. It's appropriate that I've shown them as circles rather than rectangles, but to accord with Coslin's theory, each image should fade away at the edges. As a neuroscientist, as well as a psychologist, Coslin was not only concerned in shape and diffusion, but also in what he perceived as three types of process that operate on images in the visual buffer. The generation process acts on information about the appearance of objects and their spatial structure, stored in the long-term memory to create an image in the buffer. 
we become conscious of this pattern of activity taking place. And through a process of inspection, we can then recognize the shape, spatial configurations, and other characteristics of imagined objects. And finally, through transformation processes that rotate, scale in size, and translate the pattern of cells in the buffer, we're able to examine visual mental images from all points of view. I can illustrate this extraordinary mental facility by reference to those much maligned intelligence tests which ask us to pick out one specific representation of an object which is incongruent with others. And to solve such problems, we have to take an imaginary rotational journey round an object so as to see it from all directions. Only then do we know if one is either the same as or different from another. These tests are considered to be fair because they use a common pictorial language spoken by everybody. But in fact, people have differing innate abilities to sense pictorial mental imagery. It seems that those of us who have a spatial pictorial mind are at an advantage over those who don't. These deeper ramifications of visual mental imagery have been the cause of an imagery debate that has occupied the minds of philosophers for hundreds of years. David Hume, for example, underlined the great resemblance between percepts and mental images in every other particular except their degree of force and vivacity. Others, including Jean-Paul Sartre, argued that mental images have a radically different phenomenological status from percepts. It's a debate that will continue to rage as long as the activities of the human brain remain mysterious. For me, it raises the question, can I, or should I, try to manipulate or control listeners' visual mental responses when I create a piece of visual music? Responses that might differ radically from my own very personal ones. I always answer yes to this question with the proviso, as long as the visual music I produce adds to listeners' experience of music by informing on its context and arousing emotions that might otherwise lie dormant. To further describe the challenges and delights of making visual music, I'll turn now to my most recent piece, a visual interpretation of Luciano Berio's Sequenza 9A for solo clarinet. The composer wrote this piece in 1980, midway through his lifelong exploration into the idiomatic potential of instrumental sound. I'm going to play just the first part of the piece.
as you will have heard, Berio's Sequenza 9A is overtly theatrical, certainly when played live. And as with all his sequenza, Berio believed that it's the theatrical nature of virtuosity that captures an audience's attention. You can see here Berio's tongue-in-cheek thoughts on that subject. In my visual interpretation of Sequenza 9a, you'll have seen that I use patterns and images indicative of nature to build on the basic elements of the composer's musical thought. In the piece, Berio explores at length one specific harmonic field, but avoids repetition by springing constant surprises in terms of speed, pitch and rhythmic variety. It's an exercise in musical discovery that I've interjected with images gleaned from deep dream artificial intelligence. And together, these give the impression of an otherworldly passeggiata in and around a mountain village in Liguria, the province of Italy where Berio was born and lived. These images and the deep neural networks that have engendered them have enabled me to interpret the multiplicity of Berio's musical devices with mental visual imagery that conveys intimations of a natural world familiar to the composer. A sense of theatricality is created by matching Berio's notation with similarly fast-moving virtuosic geometry. Does this succeed in adding to the piece's emotional impact, I wonder, and does it assist audiences in coming to terms with a formidable work by one of the last century's most experimental composers. I'm hoping it does, but you today's audience will have to be the judge of that. I've now described my own journey of discovery in uncovering new facets of the relationship between music and visual imagery. I started with Hindustani classical music because it's in the form of raga that music becomes art in mind. As I've explained, audiences in India engage with raga performances by allowing themselves to enter a meditative state of mind so as to follow more closely the performance. In this special case of the first performance of Olivier Messiaen's Quartet for the End of Time, which as you'll remember included a beam des oiseaux, the relationship between musicians and audience similarly was a genuinely shared experience. Four musician prisoners, including the composer, played the piece to an audience of other prisoners with their guards on a freezing night in 1941. For the composer, it was a life-changing moment, with the audience not only hanging on to every note, but also experiencing the same heightened state of awareness as the musicians. A shared experience where, as in performances of Indian raga, the art of music enters the mind and brain. If I can emulate such shared experiences through the developing art form of visual music, I will feel that my own journey of discovery is fully justified.